Enniscorthy in County Wexford is famous for its part in the rebellion of 1798, when Wolf Tone and his United Irishmen tried to achieve independence from England. But over a century before that, in 1659, two brothers from Cornwall arrived in Enniscorthy and brought with them the craft of the potter. Their name was Carly, and they found suitable clay near the town and started a pottery which survives in Wexford to this day. Wexford is a beautiful county, with gently undulating hills and meandering streams. This is Carley's Bridge over the River Urn, a delightful spot to stand for a while and listen to the ripple of the gently flowing stream and the murmur of the bees in the rhododendrons. Summer was the time for brick-making, too, because when the wet clay was filled into moulds, it needed the summer sun and wind to dry it, just as concrete blocks are made today. Lush grass grows now where the old brickyards used to thrive, but the bricks that were made here still survive in buildings all around Enniscorthy in the walls of the post office and of St. Senan's Hospital. In the middle of the last century, Carley's pottery belonged to George Carley Owens, who built the present family house for his wife, Mary Ann Warren of Springmount Gorey. But he died of pneumonia in 1875 before he could move into the new house. The business stayed in the family and passed on to his son, George Jackson Owens. When George Jackson Owens died in 1931, his widow ran the potteries for seven years, and then Robert Carley Owens took over. He was in the Irish Army during the emergency, so the pottery was let for seven more years to a Miss Phoebe Donovan until World War II ended in 1945. This is the beautiful setting that great-grandfather George Carley Owens chose on which to build his house for his bride, Mary Ann Warren. And here today, Robert Carley Owen's widow, Dorothy, has created a magnificent garden beside the river that flows under Carley's bridge and past the pottery. Well, reversing the pots on the boards seems to have cured the problem of the bottoms cracking mm. quite, quite effectively. Yeah. And now the next generation takes over, her son, Jackson Owens, and his brother-in-law, Tony Sutton, who is managing director. And so the line of descent continues unbroken from the two brothers who came to Enniscorthy away back in 1659. This is Paddy Murphy, the master potter. His mother's name was Brickley, and her father and grandfather and great-grandfather were all master potters at Carley's Bridge. So Paddy Murphy can trace his professional craft back five generations. For a family that makes bricks and tiles and pots to be called Brickley is obviously not a coincidence. Paddy learned his craft from his uncles and grandfather, and they in turn learned it from great-grandfather Sam Brickley, who lived to the ripe old age of 107, which says something for a life devoted to working with the clay. And good clay is the first essential for a pottery, and at Carley's Bridge, it's not far away. On Saturday morning, July the 19th, 1879, Mr. George Griffiths, the printer, published at his old established printing office at 5 Slaney Place, Enniscorthy, that week's edition of the Watchman and County Wexford Advertiser, which contained a notice to say that Carley's Bridge Potteries was to be let, together with the entire plant and a few acres of land adjoining, on which the best material for the manufacture of flower pots and earthenware is easily obtained. And now, a hundred years later, James Pear, John O'Rourke and Tom Doyle are digging up some of that material for Paddy Murphy the potter. It's a simple task, but very hard work. They strip off the topsoil, and there's the clay, maybe seven or eight feet deep. Dig it out like turf and carry it away.
It's heavy, and digging it breeds lean bodies and hard muscles. It's hot work, too, because this is a summer job. In winter, the clay will be so wet and soft that the sides of the marl hole would collapse in upon them. Good potter's clay comes in many colors, from white to cream, pink, red, black. Humus produces the darker colors, but this burns away during the firing in the kiln. Paddy Murphy's favorite clay is a nice blue marl. And when the men arrive with a new load, he wants to see it for himself immediately. From his 30 years experience in the pottery, he can forecast the behavior of the clay straight away how it will be to work with, how it will fire in the kiln, what sort of pots it will be suitable for. He can even tell them exactly where it was dug. Now begins the process of getting the clay into the right condition for the potter. It must be thoroughly soaked with water. If the clay is allowed to become dry at this stage, it will never develop the plasticity needed. The clay is chopped with a shovel to make sure the water permeates to every part of the pile. It needs to be turned three or four times and sprinkled with water. Stones and other foreign bodies must be removed. The idea is to create a plastic medium of even consistency. If during the winter frost should get at the clay, the freezing of the water will break the clay apart into fine particles, making it smooth and even when the water thaws again rather like the way a farmer achieves a good spring tilth from leaving roughly dug soil to weather. When the heap is properly moistened, it must be kept damp. So it is covered first with wet sacks and then with sheets of polythene. This keeps away the burning sun and the drying winds. And the clay is left to slacken. The main constituents of clay are silica and alumina and various oxides, and chemical activity goes on as the clay rests. How long the clay should be left to mature is a matter of choice. The longer the better. One Chinese potter is reputed to have refused to work with any clay that had not been maturing for at least 300 years. The longer the clay is allowed to slack, the easier it is to work with. It becomes more elastic and there is less trouble with big pots when the clay is even and smooth. When the clay has had some months to slacken, to mature, it begins to develop the consistency that the potter likes. So the time has come to bring it to the pug mill. Wet clay is a very heavy substance and working it can be exhausting. Some African tribes to this day work the clay with their feet, rather like the treading of the grapes in the making of wine. But the Industrial Revolution and the electric motor have combined to produce a mechanical mixer for the clay. So the time has come to bring it to the pug mill. Here it is put through a series of rollers to squeeze it and press it together until there are no hard areas left in it, no air bubbles, no holes. No one takes any chances with the preparation of the clay, so it is put through the mill a second time, just to make sure. Period of waiting is over, and the clay moves nearer to its date with the potter. Paddy Murphy now starts the final working of the clay. This is called wedging. He can judge the weight of a ball of clay with great exactness 
and knows precisely how much will be needed for the pot he has in mind. Now he takes it to the potter's wheel to be transformed from an inert lump of shapeless clay into a flower pot. He keeps a supply of hot water handy in case the clay needs an extra drop. It also keeps his fingers warm and prevents him becoming caked with the clay. He begins by cleaning the wheel. Next, he puts a pot of the required size on the wheel and sets the gauge markers. It looks so simple. But when Paddy started, at 14 years of age, he began with a small four-inch pot, and it was a couple of years before he was allowed to progress to a five-inch. Behind this apparent ease lies 30 years of dedicated and concentrated work. A piece of wire is used to cut the pot loose from the wheel. It's very important to clean your hands of all excess clay before you attempt to pick up a newly made pot, otherwise finger marks will be left on the smooth surface. As the wheel spins, it tends to throw the clay outwards through centrifugal force, hence the term to throw a pot. As the potter's fingers tell the clay what shape it must become, Total concentration is needed. If my mind wanders at all, Paddy says, as sure as God, I'll put my fingers clean through the pot. As the clay spins, one can see what damage could be done to these creative hands if there remained in the clay a sharp stone, piece of metal, or glass. As the pot dries later, it will shrink, and Paddy has to estimate how much larger to make the initial pot to allow for this. Different clays shrink different amounts and only years of experience can give the answer. The condition of the clay is all important. If it is too hard and dry, it is almost impossible to work. If it's too wet and soft, it will collapse when you are attempting a pot as large as this one. The only limit to a potter of paddy skill is the length of the potter's arm to reach down inside the pot as it's being formed. The base of the pot, too, is extremely important. If it's too thin, the pot will collapse later. And when the pots are stacked in the kiln, this could cause a real disaster. If the base is too thick, the pot will dry unevenly, and that leads to the pot cracking. Paddy can throw nearly 200 medium-sized pots in a day, but here's a piece that takes a week to complete. It begins in the usual way with a ball of clay slapped down on the center of the wheel, a touch of his fingers and the pot begins to rise. He brings it up on the inside and shapes it with a rib. When it's ready, it's put carefully aside to dry out a little. After two days, it has reached a stage called leather hard, which means that it has set and dried to the point where it can be cut or drawn on with a pencil, and the edges of the marks will curl into small shavings and not crumble away. It goes back on the wheel, upside down, and is held in place with lumps of fresh clay. Then, a small hole is opened in the base, and 
is raised up into a cone. When the cone is completed, the piece is put away for another four or five days. Now, a little bit of surgery. And a few sections are removed. Now what do you do with it? Well, I'll tell you. You get a ladder, climb on the roof, and put it on top of your house. And it will prevent jackdaws from nesting in your chimney. When the pots are thrown, they're taken to the drying rooms, where they will remain for five or six weeks. There's no glass in the windows here, so that there is a free circulation of air. It's important that the pots dry out slowly and evenly before they go to the kiln. And, of course, different sized pots take different lengths of time to dry. In winter, braziers have to be lit here sometimes to keep out frost, which could wreck an entire batch in a few hours. Then comes the day when the pots have to be moved into the kiln for the next stage of the process, firing. Their days in the drying room are over, and the stacking of the pots in the kiln begins. The standard flower pots go at the bottom and are built up row by row. The ornamental pots, with their curved shapes, must go on top. It takes up to two days to fill the kiln. It is 15 feet wide and 10 feet high and can take 20,000 pots. Stacking them is an art in itself. The heat must reach all the pots evenly, and allowances must be made for the fact that the pots will expand at first as they're exposed to the heat, and later contract. This is a downdraft type of kiln, and the heat is sucked down past the pots and out through holes in the tiles in the floor. On Wednesday, when the kiln is full, James Pear mixes up a mortar from yellow marl clay to brick up the doorway because no normal door could withstand the heat from the series of coal fires which will be lit all around the walls of the kiln. Between three and four tons of coal will be needed. The wall is made of fire bricks because the temperature inside the kiln will rise to nearly 1,200 degrees centigrade, 12 times hotter than boiling water. This kiln is a beehive type, replacing the older bottleneck kiln. In this one, the fires are lit around the walls the heat is drawn into the kiln and rises to the roof. It is then taken down through the pots in a downdraft, and finally the hot air is ducted out through a chimney. It's very important to let the heat build up slowly and evenly. When ashes are being raked out or new coal added, it must be done with great care so that the temperature doesn't drop suddenly. Willie Cogley is the expert on the firing of the kiln, and he will be on duty now day and night until the fire has transformed the dull grey clay into the warm and rich colours of the finished pot. Now it's Friday night, and the fires have been burning for more than two days and nights, and Willie Cogley is still on duty.
Monday morning. If you are feeling the effects of a late night last night, there is no better way to get rid of it than by emptying the kiln. Even though everything has cooled down by pottery standards, it's still very hot by human standards. In the old days, Carley's Bridge pottery used to make drainage pipes and other articles of that sort, but this size of pottery cannot cope with the bulk required for that kind of commercial operation. Transport charges are high and breakages in transit very costly. This is really a place for the skilled, handmade craft. And in order to survive in this commercial age, Carleys have taken on agencies for plastic pots and bitumen pots for nurserymen and gardeners. And so the craft of the potter can survive. It's like the recording giants using the profits from the sale of pop records to finance the recordings of the great classical orchestras. And with Paddy Murphy, only the best will do. Past. Rejected. Much of the output of Carley's Bridge Pottery goes to market via Kilkenny Design, but people come from near and far to select their pots here at the pottery. The process of making a flower pot is so fascinating in itself that it's easy to forget what the point of the exercise really is. To make a container for a plant and to sell it. Some people come to the pottery with a truck and buy 200, 300, 500 pots. Others are commercial growers who might talk in thousands. Who knows what future these pots are going to have? Tomatoes in a greenhouse? Geraniums on a patio? That's quite enough. That's a good pot, actually. It's quite big Jackson big. Owens and Tony Sutton plan oh, the commercial ventures oh, that will make sure that the craft of the potter will not die out. Paddy Murphy loves his craft and doesn't want to do anything else with his life. He has tried to teach apprentices the skills that were handed down to him, but so far, no one has shown any great fondness for the work. As Paddy says, That's a class of a sin to see that craft dying out, because there's nobody to follow me, because I, I am the last of the potters attached to the family. But Paddy himself has no intention of retiring. He is going to go on making beautiful things on his potter's wheel. Well, I can see myself making pots for another 20 or 25 years. I don't see why not. When my great-grandfather made pots in nearly 90 years of age, which he did. <laughs>